Okay, it's, it's a great pleasure to have a conversation with a distinguished astrophysicist and astronomy professor, George Blumenthal, who happens to be also uh, my campus's chancellor. And I wanted to start off with giving you a chance to say how computation has impacted your own work and maybe the work of your department. Well, I, I come from the Astronomy and Astrophysics Department, Ira, and um, where we have both observers and theorists. And I'm a theorist, and I, I spend my life as a theoretical astrophysicist. So I've been in computation throughout my career. Uh, I have to admit to you in some embarrassment that my programming language is Fortran. Uh, but never, nevertheless, a, a lot of my important, most important work was done computationally, even though I would not describe myself as one of the heavy computational users. Uh, on the other hand, in my department, among our other theorists, we have people who do modeling of supernova explosions, which is one of the most complicated computational problems. We have people who are doing simulations of large-scale structure in the universe, including the formation of galaxies and stars, and what that does, or may, using that to make predictions about what astronomers should observe in the distant universe. Those are heavily computational. Uh, uh, projects that often involve large collaborations as well in, in, in theoretical astrophysics. On the observational side, computation is crucial. Modern astronomy couldn't exist without computation because that's how astronomers do data analysis. Uh, modern telescopes uh, uh, are a far cry from the old days when somebody would take a picture. Today it's all digital, it's all data analysis, and the real issues that actually both theorists and observers have is how to observe their data because there is so much data that's obtained either through computation or through data analysis. Well, I know that because uh, I visited it myself that we have a strong relationship with Keck and that, uh, in fact, one of my own ex-PhDs uh, went to the Keck facility as a computational scientist. It, how would you describe uh, the campus's relations with things like Keck and Lick? Okay, so you mentioned two, two of the three observatories that uh, UC is involved with. Uh, Lick Observatory is, you know, 125 years old uh, observatory on Mount Hamilton outside of San Jose. But the exciting science is now being done at the Keck Observatory. Keck is a, th is a 10 meter telescope, or actually it's two 10 meter telescopes that were originally conceived of at UC Santa Cruz. We were the people who first came up with the idea of building a, a 10 meter telescope. And the two Keck telescopes are a partnership between Caltech and the University of California system. Uh, Santa Cruz is, is, the, is the place where the UC system, the entire University of California system, interfaces with those telescopes. And I'm on the uh, board of directors that oversees the two Keck telescopes. They are, they are tremendous scientific instruments. Uh, in fact, over the last 20 years, there, is no, uh, there are no other ground-based telescopes that have produced more science, more PhD students and more exciting results than the Keck telescopes. So that's really something that the university is proud of. And our current project is actually to build uh, a 30 meter telescope. Uh, so the diameter, it would be ground based, it would be in Hawaii. The diameter would be 30 meters. It would also be, just like the Keck telescopes, a segmented mirror uh, telescope. And uh, that's going to be a partnership with Caltech, as well as several other countries, including China, Japan, India, and Canada. So um, uh, that's a really exciting future. Oh, that's great. Uh, in fact, I was looking at a survey of the 51,000 students I have, and the countries you all mentioned are very, very significantly represented. And indeed, I think. Uh, all these students are taking what effectively here is an upper division advanced programming course and they're deeply interested in what would be computational opportunities if they were to think about coming here. And I know you're the chancellor of the campus nearest Silicon Valley or you're 
in some sense, Silicon Valley South. Uh, what programs would you highlight and how do you view the Silicon Valley campus uh, in, in terms of a resource for UCSC? So uh, before I get into the Silicon Valley issue, let me just say that uh, I do hope that some of your 50,000 students will end up uh, perhaps using these observatories. Uh, that we're using the 30 meter telescope uh, uh, when it comes online in 2022 and uh, uh, I, I'll definitely look forward to that and I, I think it would be great if they learned their programming from you uh, in this MOOC so uh, I think that's a great opportunity. So turning to Silicon Valley, uh, UC Santa Cruz is the University of California campus closest to Silicon Valley. We see ourselves as the UC of Silicon Valley. And we have a number of strong programs there already, and we see more coming uh, along. Our, one of our biggest efforts is in data sciences. Uh, and, um, and we now have uh, existing master's programs in electrical engineering, in technology management, which is a, is a new field and a very exciting uh, uh, new field, and in computer game design, which is also a field that's really uh, um, attracted a lot of attention and a lot of students recently. Uh, we have uh, also a bunch of research going on in Silicon Valley, largely through the School of Engineering, but also associated with the NASA Ames uh, Center. NASA has one of their, fa uh, one of their uh, major research centers in Silicon Valley, and we have a very close working relationship with them. In fact, UC Santa Cruz currently holds the largest competitive contract that NASA has ever given to a university uh, in Silicon Valley. So we have a, a great deal of research collaboration going on with them as well. And that's really quite exciting. As I look to the future, I see uh, uh, some of our next developments being in other areas of data sciences. We have an exceptionally strong group, for example, in storage systems, in computer networking, in robotics. Uh, all of those are areas that are of, of great interest to companies in Silicon Valley. And so, and maybe I'll end this answer to this question by pointing out that a lot of our students, undergraduates and graduate students, have great opportunities to do uh, internships with companies in Silicon Valley. That's benefited the campus, it's benefited them as students, and it's benefited the companies that they work for. Uh, and programs like computer sciences, which you're associated with, uh, had a, have had great success. I think our computer sciences program, if you look at their graduates of our computer sciences program. They're among the highest earning uh, 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 students uh, of any computer sciences programs in the country. And it's something to be really proud of. And a lot of that is due to our proximity to Silicon Valley and the jobs of Silicon Valley. Uh, I also know, uh, because I, uh, I actually, uh, once upon a time, hired David Hausler when I was chairman <laughs> of computer science. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. <laughs> that, uh, and indeed, a lot of my course is about graph algorithms, even though uh, uh, his algorithmic work and Markov prediction is somewhat a graph algorithm. He and Jim Kent, uh, Jim Kent is a heavy duty C programmer, so there's uh, a deep interest in algorithms in C++ that my students uh, are doing in which uh, UCSC has had a very big impact. I didn't know if you had any additional comments about that whole genomics and uh, I know it's also large data, the cancer genome projects. Uh, do you have anything that you're seeing uh, that will be happening? Oh, absolutely. And that's happening on campus and maybe even a little bit in Silicon Valley as well. But it's really one of the most exciting fields uh, in the country or even in the world is genomics. And the reason UC Santa Cruz is so uh, central to modern genomics and human health is through the work of David Hausler uh, and, and his colleagues. Uh, because the Human Genome Project was actually completed at UC Santa Cruz in the year 2000 by, by David. Um, he was the person who figured out the algorithm to connect the little pieces of the human genome together and make the final version. And it was UC Santa Cruz that put the first draft of the human genome up on the web. 
So we were the people who did that. And since then, that was that. Since then, we've moved on to even better things. Uh, currently, uh, David is involved in an international collaboration on cancer genomics. Uh, the National Cancer Institute in the United States has already named UC Santa Cruz the cancer genome hub for the country. So uh, we are where uh, data from all labs in the United States currently store their cancer genomics data. And uh, uh, we have many people doing research on, the, on these data, trying to identify the properties of different types of cancers and, and, and eventually potential treatments. I think the key point here is that cancer is really a digital disease because it represents uh, defects in the DNA of cells in one's body, and which can be described digitally. And, uh, and so, in fact, what's really interesting is that it may be the computer geeks who solve cancer rather than the uh, laboratory people in white coats. Uh, because understanding the, the nature of the digital disease may turn out to be the crucial element to conquering that horrible disease. And even though our campus, at UC Santa Cruz, doesn't have a medical school, we're right at the center of this exciting project. Oh, that's great. Uh, I want to get back to a little bit of uh, the heritage you and I share. Uh, in some ways, I feel what I'm doing now in Coursera with this large online education uh, effort it start, starts with what we came here for in the 1970s when Santa Cruz was this uh, very originally uh, designed college structure with an emphasis, a very important emphasis on teaching in a way that uh, Clark Kerr had felt UCLA and Berkeley had moved away from and that we have this deep heritage of being innovators and reaching out uh, in unique ways. I didn't know whether you wanted a comment for these international students on what the circumstance of how they would uh, participate on our campus and what that might mean and possibly where online education might go. Yeah, that's a very broad question, but it's an interesting one, Ira, because uh, as you said, you and I go back a long way. I think you and I first met as very junior assistant professors uh, way back in the Middle Ages, and uh, um, uh, when the campus uh, at Santa Cruz was very young. And we've seen uh, the evolution, not just of the campus, but of higher education, new technology, and the role that the uh, changing technology has played in, in, in higher education. One of the, I mean, there are several things that characterize our campus that really make us unique. One is uh, our physical layout. I mean, it's a beautiful campus, and I would say to any of the audience, if you haven't been to the Santa Cruz campus, you really should visit it. I mean, I think you can visit it uh, virtually on the web, but it's much actually much more impressive to visit it in person. A second thing that characterizes our campus, uh, Ira, you mentioned was the, our college structure. Uh, we try to have the best of both worlds as a campus. We have 10 relatively small residential colleges where new students uh, have the experience of taking classes with the same students that they live with. So they take classes in their college, they live with other students in their college, uh, they uh, participate in extracurricular activities in their college. So they have that small college experience when they come in as freshmen. But yet they are a part of a much larger major research university where cutting edge research is taking place in a wide variety of fields. So um, that makes this place uh, uh, an example of a unique experience that students can have. One of the other things that, that characterizes our campus is the involvement of undergraduates in research. Uh, right now, approximately 60% of our undergraduates, when they get their bachelor's degree, have been involved in research, cutting-edge research with a faculty member. That's, a, that's an almost unheard of percentage for uh, universities anywhere in the world. And the reason for that is, is that we value undergraduates and we value the importance of research as part of the educational mission. It's something we do very well. Another thing we do very well because of our origins 
is uh, working across uh, uh, divisional or disciplinary lines. Um, uh, the work I mentioned a few minutes ago about genomics really came about because a computer scientist decided to work with a biologist. Uh, we have examples like computer gaming that involve faculty and students from a wide range of disciplines, obviously engineering, but also uh, humanities because they have to think about linguistic issues, the arts because they have to think about how to represent images on the screen, social sciences because a lot of modern human gaming involves psychology, for example, and the sciences because uh, what's portrayed in a, in, a, in a game or a simulation or a training has to be consistent with the physical laws of, the, of our universe. So uh, that's an example of a field that really touches every single academic division or discipline uh, or, or area within a university. And that's something we do very well here because we're a relatively young university. So we haven't built the walls that uh, some universities have managed to build that are impenetrable. So it's really quite a unique place. Now, today, we have uh, online education and MOOCs coming to the fore. And I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to talk with you about uh, uh, really as a part of your MOOC. So first of all, impressive, you have 50,000 students, or more than 50,000 students. That's great. It means that you can really reach out and touch a large number of people all around the world. That's one of the reasons that I wanted this campus to join with Coursera, so that we could offer this kind of course. And um, uh, another example of that is, uh, uh, in fact, I think our first course that went up on Coursera was a course on the Holocaust taught by two of our faculty members, uh, one of whom is a Holocaust survivor, uh, who can bring a personal perspective to uh, studies of the Holocaust. And that's a course that's also been, just like yours, enormously successful uh, in reaching people around the world, and quite unique in terms of uh, course offerings that might be available to students anywhere in the world. So I'm really proud of the fact that we can actually display some of the unique courses and learning opportunities we developed right here on this campus and make them available to anyone anywhere. So I see that as something that has, a, has, has potentially a bright future. And I also recognize that um, the advent of online education is going to really change the way we do things. One, exam one other example, at least on our campus, is that a number of faculty have decided to flip their courses which means that instead of having a lecture in a big lecture hall at a fixed time, they record their lectures, put them online so that students can view them anytime they want to, and that frees up the professor's time so that they can actually have interaction time with students uh, in smaller groups or where there's questions and answers or where they can challenge students to think about uh, uh, the issues that come up in the course, in the classroom. It really gives professors and students have a much better chance to interact uh, with each other rather than to, to have you know, students passively just listening to lectures. So I think it's an exciting time and I look forward to the future uh, with this new technology. Okay, thank you on all of that. I, I think one last thing would be any pointers to uh, possibly websites that the international student applying here, either at the graduate undergraduate level, to look at any very specific advice to them about applying? So we really are trying to be a, a friendly campus for international students. For uh, undergraduates, uh, uh, we put in place some programs to acclimate, acclimate students who come from abroad. Uh, to the campus so that they can enroll in what is basically a two-week uh, uh, orientation uh, for students from abroad to, so that they, you know, so that it's easier to begin for them when they start as, for example, an undergraduate on the campus. We have some living arrangements that we put in place for international students so that they can actually choose if they want to, to live with other international students, but they don't have to. They can choose uh, instead to live with a group of students from the United States. So we're trying to be flexible but make it, while making sure that students from abroad have the resources that they need to, uh, uh, to succeed and to succeed wonderfully at the, at the campus. So if you go to our, if you're an under, a potential undergraduate, if you go to our website, 
uh, into our admissions page at uh, uh, www.ucse.edu. There's an admissions page you can click on, and within that admissions page, there's a specific page for international students that shows some of the resources that we have. Uh, for graduate students, many of our programs recruit heavily abroad because we are a part of the University of California, which is the, the greatest public research university in the world. And as a part of the University of California, uh, we want to make sure that our graduate students are the best in the world. And so uh, we really do try to reach out and attract the very best students because the very best student, graduate students ensures that we have the very best research programs, the very best faculty, uh, and that's really important to this campus. So one last word as, a, as an old computer scientist. Uh, uh, the, the person who invented Fortran was John Backus at IBM. He led the project in 1954. Actually, John, who is now passed, uh, came here and uh, gave some lectures here, so I even got to meet John. And the one thing said about Fortran, so you shouldn't feel bad about being a, a Fortran programmer, is that in the 21st or 22nd century, there will be programming. And whatever that programming it is, it will be named Fortran. <laughs> Fortran will never die out, George, so you have very good background to continue. Anyway, thanks a lot for taking time from, from, your, from your very busy schedule. Uh, it was just wonderful uh, being able to chat with you. Thank you, Ira. This was a real pleasure. and It's always great to see you, even if it's virtually. <laughs>